Well, good morning. Welcome to Riceville Valley Community Church. Can you hear me out there? I've been messing with my microphone this morning, so I hadn't had a, a real legit sound check. <laughs> we can hear you. Uh, grateful to be here uh, today to worship the Lord, to give great glory to his name, to lift him up to the highest place that, as where, where he belongs in our lives. So grateful to be here, glad to see uh, everybody made it in today. Um, no, no specific announcements on my part uh, that I can think of standing here on my two feet, but uh, does anybody, anybody have any announcements that they would like to make this morning? It is a zero announcement Sunday. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, let's prepare our hearts to worship the risen Lord. Some great bell ringing there. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. Thanks from, from our hearts that we're able to be here this morning to worship you. Father, that's our intent. That's why we are here today, to bring glory to your name, to give thanks to you, and Lord, to receive from you your word, your wisdom, your strength, and your peace. God, be with us today as we worship you and help us today and every day to grow closer and closer to you and to become more and more like Jesus, as you would have us to be. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you will, please stand and let's be called to worship this morning. And this comes from Psalm 71. We will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. Our mouths will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all day long, though their number is past our knowledge. We will come praising the mighty deeds of the Lord God. We will praise your righteousness, yours alone. Amen. Please remain standing, and we will get into our first hymn this morning. If I can get that microphone turned on. This is Glorify Your Name.
Well, as we need no reminder, our lives are, are filled with good things, and our lives are also filled with things that are less than desirable. Um, no, nobody's, nobody's perfect except for one who has walked this earth. Um, so it's our duty as, as children of God to go before our Father, to take to Him our shortcomings, our failures, our sins, our disobedience, and our lack of, of doing what we are actually called to do. We go to Him, we bring these confessions before Him, and receive from Him the pardon. Let us go and pray this morning. Let us pray together. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change, Open to us a future in which we can be changed and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Loved ones, when, when we go to God, we can be sure that he hears our prayers, our pleas. And he has already provided a a solution for all of our shortcomings in Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah, our sins are forgiven. Let's continue to pray this morning um, what we call the prayers of the people and uh, we invite you to lift up uh, any prayer that may be on your heart this morning. So let us go to the, to the Lord in prayer. Oh Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that you have given us the ability to, to come in here this morning, to worship you, to bring before you all that we have, all that we are. Father, we know that in Christ there is no judgment, but there is only love. And Father, we pray this morning that you'll hear these prayers that we have, we bring to you the things that, quite frankly, we either have no control of or we don't know what to do. And Father, we bring also to you those things that, that you have just placed in our lives that amaze us. How great you are. We bring before you those who are in our lives who need you. Lord, hear our prayers this morning. Lord, we do pray for, for healing and strength. For Buddy Waddell, Lord, we just pray that you would restore him and heal him and, and walk with him, Lord, through this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers.
Lord, we do give you thanks that, that your timing is perfect and you have a perfect plan. And we thank you, Lord, that you reveal that to us when your perfect timing comes. Thank you for what you've done for Josh. Thank you for what you've done for this church. And God, we just we look so forward in anticipation to see your mighty hand at work here in Riceville Valley Community Church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we do give you thanks that, as we said before, your timing is perfect. And you couldn't have brought Rick and Yvonne to, to us at a more perfect time. God, thank you for their, for their wisdom, for their energy, for their heart to help this church and to, and to love us. And Father, just help us to love them back. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we do ask that you be with Melanie and that you would uh, just be with her through her healing process. Lord, we pray that you would soften the pain, that you would take that pain away. And God, that you would uh, just give her a full and speedy recovery after this surgery she's been through. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we do pray for those who are away today, those who have not, uh, were not able to come this morning for one reason or the other. Uh, we pray that you be with them, that you fill them with your spirit. Lord, that they would feel your presence. And God, that you would protect the ones who are, who are traveling or, or, or in transit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, we do give you thanks for, for marriage, and, and Father, we give you great thanks for the Wilsons, Lord, that you have, have given them 42 years of marriage. Amazing. And God, thank you the way that, that you have used them to bless us, to bless those around them. I don't think anybody comes in contact with the Wilsons and, and doesn't walk away blessed in some way. God, thank you for this couple. Thank you for their godly example here on this earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Father, we do lift up Janice this morning. Uh, we ask that you would just uh, make her well, give her recovery from... from uh, her sickness this morning, be with her and heal her. And Lord, we just pray for Robert as well. We pray, God, that you would protect him, keep him safe, keep him in your care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Well, Father, we lift up those who have been so adversely affected by the, the winter storm this this past week, uh, lots of people, lots of people with uh, lots of problems right now. Uh, we know that it has 
the cleanup has begun, but there's, there's a lot of things to, to clean up in Texas and, and in the north. Uh, Father, we thank you that you have spared us from, from those kind of things and, and just thank you for, for keeping us uh, free from those problems. But God, we, we just pray for those folks that you would provide for them everything that they need to return to life as, as it was before that. God, we pray that your hand will continue to be on this world as we battle this virus, as we try to uh, overcome the effects that it has had on us. Father, we pray that uh, you just give us increased levels of, of immunity to it, Lord, that you would uh, allow this to, to fade and, and to be gone and be a, just a, a memory uh, soon. Father, we pray for the ones who have been affected, the ones who have been uh, have gone through sickness, and uh, we just pray that the, the after effects of that would, would diminish and, and dissolve away, and they would return to full health. Father, we pray for our, our public servants, Lord, our medical workers, our EMTs, our firefighters, police, armed forces. We pray, Lord, that you would just be with those folks and, and protect them. Give them the, the shield, Lord, that they need. We pray for our government leaders, Lord, that you would uh, give them divine guidance, Lord, that they would hear your voice and know how to, uh, how to govern and how to lead the countries of this earth. Well, we pray for missionaries who are out in the field. We pray for the ones, Lord, who are, are risking their lives to share your gospel with, with people who may, may not otherwise hear it. God, protect them. Provide what they need. Give them strength. Give them the resources, Lord. And Father, we pray that you be with us, that you will keep us in your care, that you will bless us, that you will allow us to hear your voice every day. Father, open our hearts, open our ears and our minds to receive from you what you have today and every other day. And Father, this morning, we join our voices together as one, praying as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we are blessed to uh, have Reverend Rick Sawyer with us this morning and uh, looking forward to this uh, Next uh, series of sermons that he has, it's a, it's a great, great privilege and a blessing. We got, there we go. Yeah, good morning everybody. It's good to see you, good to see you. Yeah, we are starting a new series. Um, in talking with the session uh, a little bit and asking folks, in the time that we're in and the days that we face and as we focus on this new beginning of a year and what lies ahead, I wanted to touch base on some teaching from Scripture. I'm calling it the, the reciprocal commands one another, and we'll get into that in a second, but it's a new series, and, and I wanted to ask you, as we get started, what do you think it is, or was, that drew people to Jesus? You know, I like to ask questions. <laughs> what do you think drew people to him? She, she saw my sermon notes. Yeah, yeah. Some people would say it was his teaching. Wow. 
no man, I said, no man ever spake like this, right? Nobody. They were just, even when he was 12 years old, he's in the temple. Some people might have thought, well, it was his, it was his miracles. You know, wow, nobody ever did anything like this. You'd have to be from God to do that. <sighs> yeah, when you think about it. Um, maybe it was that. Maybe it was his character, his sinlessness. Because his, even his accusers couldn't find anything against him, though, though they tried. These are all important things. And, of course, they're true. But what Swig said was right, I believe. We, a case could be made that it was his love that is essentially what drew people to him, along with everything else. But, and a case can be made, I think, for that. Um, here's what it did. Here's what it did. It shattered these barriers of hate and prejudice. That was the divisions of Samaritans. and you know, So it, these people aren't any good, and he, he broke through all of that. And he picked up the pieces of broken hearts that would come to him, just really shattered people. He would put them back together. And, and people... Um, I think of Peter and some others that were kind of aimless. Their lives were kind of floating around. That's certainly what he did to me. Purposelessness. And he gave meaning to our lives. And then he offered forgiveness where there was just condemnation. You look at that, you see this all the time in his life. And then he brought triumph out of failure. They saw it in his face. They couldn't help but see it and his touch, and they heard it from his voice, and they experienced friendships like none that they had ever known. It was living, and it was a breathing love. It was, it was palpable. It was like unlike anything anybody had ever experienced. And he transformed them and made them able to love him, and in turn, they could in new ways love others. I want you to check out, I've mentioned several times this video series, The, the Chosen. I'm going to use a couple of videos to illustrate uh, some of our points today, but I want you to check out this first little video clip, it's very brief, of the encounter, and if you want to see the whole thing, you can, you can go on, it's very powerful. This is just a clip from it. This is his encounter with the messed up, falling apart Mary Magdalene. Check this out. Mary of Magdala. Who are you? How do you know my name? Thus says the Lord who created you. Devil ridden, broken, nobody wanted any. And look what happens. Jesus came into the world, folks, to reveal God's love, just like that. 
And each Sunday we gather to worship and we celebrate that love. But the love that was Jesus, and you know this, is the same love that's given to us that the Spirit has put into our hearts. It's ours. It's the same love that we have been called to show and witness unto others. Not just brothers and sisters in Christ, but all the world. That's, our, that's one of our tasks. What were Jesus' last words to his disciples? Acts 1.8. You shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the uttermost parts of the earth. My witnesses. Witnesses to my love. And God intends that we as the church fulfill our mission outwardly to our Jerusalem and our Judea here in our community, but also then we're to go to Samaria and to the uttermost parts. And we can best accomplish this when we reach out, getting to know and love those and serve those within and without outside of our congregation. That's how it's done. But being outwardly focused is only half of the task. Think about it. An outwardly task congregation or even a business must be inwardly strong also. You think about a business or a ball team or anything you want, a school, a staff, whatever. We've got to be strong amongst ourselves if we're going to be, be able to serve. It's kind of like a couple of muscles. And you know some of that. You know, you've got to, they kind of strengthen one another. You can't exercise and strengthen one without strengthening the other. It's a mutual thing. And mutual church nurturing is, is part of the same thing, loving one another. So when we strengthen one, we strengthen the other. So here's the point. Without an inward strength and unity among ourselves and our families and our church family, without that, we won't be able to be strong in our other endeavors, particularly out in the community. And that's what we're going to be looking at today and going forward. What does this look like? Well, let's look at the New Testament. Really interesting these one another commands that we're going to look at. We're just going to look at a few of them in the next month or so, but there are 59 different times they're mentioned throughout the New Testament, 59 of them, verses that describe how God intends for us to care for one another and relate, how we're supposed to treat each other. Give me some examples. Romans 12, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Live in harmony with one another. Verse 16. 15, 7 in Romans. Accept one another. And then Colossians, Paul says, teach and admonish one another. Be completely humble, gentle, patience, bearing with one another, he tells us in Ephesians 4. Bear with one another. And then finally in as an example, 1 Thessalonians 5, encourage one another and build each other up. So this morning we're beginning this new series of messages, these one another commands. And we'll examine some of them, and we'll do so by looking at the one principle, I think, the granddaddy of all principles and one another commands that form the foundation of the others. And it's the one command, listen, echoed by three different New Testament author, authors. Three different authors focus on this in four different New Testament books, and it's repeated nine times, and it's the call to love one another. Listen, listen to the role. We've mentioned already some of these commands, but listen to the role that love plays in these one another commands. We're starting out with love one another. We've already mentioned be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Be sympathetic, compassionate, love as brothers. Serve one another in love. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. 59 of them. Here's the point. 
we can't be the family that God intends here and out there without love. We just, it's, it's just not going to happen for any church, for any family, for any, anything. And as, you know, as Christians, I guess we could be defined by our mission, seek and save the lost, very important, be my witnesses. We could be known by our worship or any other of our church-related tasks. But guess which is the only one another command that Jesus ever mentioned? Obviously. Over in John 13, 34, and 35, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It's the only time he mentioned any of these one another commands. And here we have it. And Jesus says the one thing, listen, the one thing that should set us apart from the rest of the world Anything else is our love for one another. There's a story about some lady that was in the choir, and she came home really early. I mean, she was her husband was expecting her, you know, usually an hour and a half, and 20 minutes she's home. He said, what in the thunder are you doing home? She says, oh, well, I guess I could tell you this. The choir director and the organist got in a big fight over how they were going to sing Divine Love. <laughs> so they sent us home. We laughed to keep from crying. Well, that's not untypical. But, you know, it gets, this loving one another gets more strategic than, than just kind of the obvious stuff there. In Matthew 22, let me read this to you. Matthew 22, 36 to 40. It says, I'll start in 34. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. They were trying to catch him. Saying, teacher, which is the great, great commandment in the law? Jesus said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What he's saying is that everything in Scripture hangs on those two commands. Love God, love your neighbor. Boom. And, and, and that's... That's, that was so heretical back then in a lot of ways, particularly in a divided community and a nation and a society that they lived in. But it gets even more interesting. Follow me here. Follow me. Listen to what he prays to his father. It's called the priestly prayer in John 17. He doesn't pray just for the disciples, but for all who would believe in him going forward, and that's us. Listen to what he said. As you sent me, Father, into the world, I have also sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify them, that they themselves may also be sanctified in truth. Now listen. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, meaning the disciples, but for those who also believe in me through their word. That's us. That's every Christian that ever believed. That they may all be one, even as you, Father, and I are in me, and you, and I in you, that they may be in us. So, listen, that the world may believe that you sent me. That they may be one so that the world would believe, Father, that you sent me. I remember as a young Christian in the, in the mid-70s, like a sponge, everything was new. Every, I could tell you all some stories that God just, I just couldn't believe it. Witnessing to my friends, and he's got me going over to 
UNCA professors talking to them, and I didn't know anything. But I was introduced to a fellow named Francis Schaeffer. Some of you may have heard of him. He was easily one of the most important theologians in the 20th century, and his impact is still felt. His name was Francis Schaeffer. And he wrote a book in 1970 called The Mark of the Christian. I want you to listen to this. He stated that, now we're talking about the Father that they world would believe that you, that you sent me because the church loves one another. Listen to what he says. I'll quote him. The world has a right to judge Christianity by the way we treat each other as believers. Do you hear that? The world has a right to judge us. Is there anything to this Jesus thing based on how the church loves one another? That's what he's saying. That's what Jesus said. Our relationship with each other is the criterion the world uses to judge whether or not our message is truthful. And he and Jesus believed that love for one another was the ultimate confirmation for Christianity. And he referred to it as the final apologetic. Apologetics is in not just Christian terms, but it's a, it's a term, it's a, it's a science, it's a, it's, a, it's a discipline of taking evidence to, to, to support whether something is true or not. So we have apologetics about how we can trust in God's word, the resurrection, all kinds of things. And so Schaefer says that is the final apologetic, is does the church love each other? And, and, and follow me, this is what he's saying. Simply put, it would be like this. It, it would be like Jesus saying this. Let's flip it. This is just logic. So the reverse, the reason this is so stunning and so important is this. Jesus is actually saying, flip it. So, Father, if the world does not see the love that the church has for one another, they don't see it then they don't have any reason to believe that you even sent me. Do you ever think of that? It's called logic, but it's just, both some of us, I mean, I had never thought about that. But it's, he's flipping it over. It's not messing with Scripture, but the, the implication is if the world does not see the church loving each other and loving the world, why should we believe? And that's, to be honest with you, the statistics are telling us that that's a lot of why the present generation of kids have abandoned the church almost up to 75%. I don't know if you knew that or not. They're abandoning because they don't see any of this. And what can we say? Think about what's going on in our society today. The church loving one another. They're driving down the street. You see that church over there? <laughs> they don't wear masks. Right, right there. What? Yeah, I know the women don't cover their heads. I heard about that one. I know it. I can't believe they think that they're going to church on their phone. I just don't know if God's going to punish them. Wait a minute. You voted for who? Get out of this car. I'm not making light, but folks, this is where we've come as a church. And you see it everywhere. I'm in conversations with people across the United States. I just sat down with people from our denomination earlier this week, and they're sharing some of the struggles. I'm not gossiping, I'm just telling you that we are a hot mess in many ways. And I'm afraid I'm part of the problem too, sometimes with a judgmental attitude. Getting real here. This is not an abstract type of thing where we're floating around and we all agree, listen, we all agree in the command, the principle to love. Yeah, of course. We sing about it, we, you know, we read about it, we talk about it, we pray about it, we teach about it, but let's be honest, we have a hard time 
in our families, in our churches, and we have a hard time communicating our love and loving one another in ways that can be seen. It's not some sort of thing up there. Did you hear about the, the dad? There was a guy, he saved up his money because his, his, his driveway was a mess. And he saved up enough money to have it uh, done over. And the truck pulled off and he got some wire and rope and some little flags and he put around the, 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 the driveway so that, you know, and he, son, come here. Now listen at me. You better not touch this concrete. It's wet. You hear me? Are you listening to me? Son, look up here. Yeah, dad. Yeah, dad. Okay. So he goes in the house. And the little boy's out running around. He comes flying around the corner. <laughs> you know what happened? Mom was out there. Uh-oh. And daddy runs out there. And here is it's a footprints all over this. And the truck's gone. I mean, he's nearly messed this thing up. Well, he goes ballistic. Daddy goes through the roof, and he says, Come here to me! Didn't I tell you? And he's just about ready to... And Mama comes in with compassion, and remember, he's our son, and you love him. And you know what Daddy said? Well, I may love him in the abstract, but I don't love him in the concrete. Now, we're often like daddy. It's nice to, but boy, when they cross us, sometimes we have a hard time loving specific people in the concrete. And sometimes, guess what? Do you ever have anybody in your life that gets into your concrete? You think about that. Anyway, a lot of people, and, and it's not about our emotions. This is point B on your outline. Our society is telling us today that love is, is an emotional response. This is what we're taught. A lot of people have a problem. How in the world are you going to command somebody to love somebody else? How, how do you command that? Science and medicine have boiled it down. Well, it's just a biochemical reaction. And love is something that we fall into love. And we fall out of love. And we can't determine who. It just happens. <laughs> Hormones and molecules. And Ray, Ray Stedman, a great Christian writer, wrote this. He says, loving people is about the most difficult thing some of us can do. We can be patient with people and even charitable. But how are we supposed to conjure up in our hearts warm, effervescent sentiment of goodwill, which the New Testament calls love. And he's saying some people are so miserably unlovable. Now, how are we supposed to stir up these feelings? And you know what Jesus said? You don't have to. You can't. Now, follow me. In most cases, we will never be able in our own power to love people, though we try. We want to, but the fact is feelings are not the issue on this matter. And this goes totally counterculture to our society today. The love that Jesus commands, folks, is not a feeling. And you can't command a feeling. Jesus' view of love is different. We saw an illustration of that a few minutes ago. Nobody wanted this woman. I mean, if you, when you go on and see that particular series, The Calling of Mary and Magdala, you'll see it. Wow. They've really portrayed it well. It's not primarily a feeling, but folks, it's a choice that we make. It's a decision to treat others in a gracious and a genuine, generous manner. That's what it is. And it's, and, and it's not about how I feel about you but how I treat you. It's not based on what you can do for me, but it's Jesus, my life for yours. Wow. Somebody will say, well, yeah, you know, Rick, that's true. 
Jesus is going to come back and pull us out of all this mess and that, what's that new heavens and new earth and heaven and everything? We're going to be loving up on each other. Well, that's true. But you forget one thing. It's supposed to happen now in the here and now. It ain't pie in the sky by and by. Loving one another begins in the here and now when we walk out this door. In John 13, 35, 30, uh, 34 and 35, the Lord doesn't just give us command and leave it at that. He calls us to love each other and then detaches to it the greatest measuring stick available. We just read that. His love, that's the, that's the measuring stick. As I have loved you, so you love others. There it is. Here's the point. God's standard of love is the very highest and that's what we aspire to by the power of God's spirit and just what kind of love are we what does it look like let's talk about that this is Roman numeral five what does this love look like first of all it's a selfless love it's not based on what we do for God we're not trying to earn not what we can do for him not how faithful we are to him, although that's important, or how we make him feel God's love selflessly, generously, unconditionally. He offers himself to us. He's already done it in Christ. It's not what we do. It's what he's done and accomplished for us. And the Greek word, as you probably know, is agape. Agape. It's a love that, that commits itself on behalf of others. You've probably heard that word. So it's a selfless love, my life for yours, putting the needs and interests of others before us, which is not always easy at all. But it's also a forgiving love. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13 that love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. I remember what he did to me. Yep, I remember. I'll never forget it. <laughs> That's not love. It's a love modeled after Christ's forgiving love for us on the cross. What did Paul say in Ephesians 4? Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other just as Christ in God forgave you. It's a selfless love. It's a forgiving love. And it's a sacrificial love. And it does more than just think of the other. It does more than forgive it lays self aside on behalf of others. It's dying to ourselves. Whew. Listen to what C.S. Lewis said. This is powerful. I want you to listen to this. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Listen, to love anybody is to make yourself vulnerable. If you love anything, this is, this is true. Do you think about the situation in your life? If you love anything or anyone, and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. Think about past relationships or maybe what's going on right now. You love someone, you're vulnerable, you're going to get your heart broken sometimes. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact and staying safe, you must give your heart to no one. Wrap it around carefully. Hobbies and little luxuries, golf, fun stuff. Stay away from people, though. Avoid any kind of entanglement with anybody. Lock it up safe in the casket of your own selfishness. But in that casket, safe and dark and motionless and airless, where you've put yourself, your heart will change. It won't be broken it will become unbreakable. Impenetrable, irredeemable. The on, listen to this. The only place outside heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers of love is hell. Phew. Check out this scene. One more video. I want you to look. We're talking about selfless thing, seeing in people what.
We live in the same world, Matthew. Next. Besides, what else are you going to do with a mind like yours? Matthew. Matthew, son of Alpheus. Yes. Follow me. Yes, you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what are you doing? You want me to join you? Keep moving, street preacher. Do you have any idea what this guy has done? Do you even know him? Yes. Listen, I said to... What are you doing? Where do you think you're going? Guys, let me go. Have you lost your mind? You have money. Quintus protects you. No Jew lives as good as you. You're gonna throw it all away. Chose you either. But this is different. I'm not a tax collector. Get used to different. I'm glad we passed by your booth today, Matthew. Yes. Shall we? We have a celebration to prepare for. You will regret this, Matthew. What's the tablet for? I grabbed it without thinking. Can put it back? No, no, keep it. You may yet find use for it. Where are we going? A dinner party. I'm not welcome at dinner parties. Well, that's not going to be a problem tonight. You're the host. It could be in your family, your workplace, a a friend in the community, maybe somebody is a part of the fellowship of this church. Someone that is you find hard to love. Think, I'm going to take a second. I want you to get that person in your mind. Picture someone that is difficult to love. I got somebody. They try your patience. They take advantage of you. They treat you differently than anybody else. They test your Christian character. Guess what? Get used to different. Jesus wants you to love that person as he loves you.
He wants us, the people that we have in our minds, He wants us to love them as He loves us. It doesn't matter how they make us feel or what they've done for us or how much we like being... No. He wants us to love them just like He loves us. We heard what He said to Peter, and He said, get used to different. That was the underscoring thing of almost His entire ministry in, in certain ways. Everything, the calling of Matthew. Did you see? I think they did a good job. This, they were the most despised people in the community among the Jews. A traitor. And all those people that he drew together, Mary was a, don't even use the word for her. And he grabbed all these messed up people and he pulled them together and they changed the world. And we wouldn't be here if that hadn't happened. It's worth mentioning that Jesus worded his grammar in a specific way. That one another thing, it's not just a one-off. Okay, yeah, well, don't tell him you're sorry, and that's it. It's an ongoing thing in the continual Greek. It's keep loving them and keep loving them and keep loving them and keep loving them. Continuous. So this morning, let's trust God to get us past all of our constantly changing feelings, and our petty differences and our superficial likes and dislikes and simply love one another as he loves us. That's the point today. And it, but until we, and until we do, we will never see the full power of God working in our lives and the lives of our families and the lives of this church until we do this fully. Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And this is a different kind of love that he's talking about. It shows the power of God and the kind of love when we show it to others that will draw people to him. So, dear ones, let us get used to loving people differently. Lord, thank you for your precious word and the example of our Savior who not only models love but the cost of his own life and Lord I just pray for each one of us here maybe we're struggling with this I know it's it's hard for all of us Lord but by your spirit as we move forward in sharing what this means what it means to model living under your lordship Lord by your spirit help us to repent help us to make things right with folks if we have to Give us what we need, because in and of ourselves, Lord, we cannot do this. We know we cannot do this, but by the power of the Spirit, you can. Get us where we need to go. Let us empower us to love all of those around us in a different way. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. maybe a new song to you all. So we're going to go through the first verse in the chorus and then come back around at it again. <laughs> um, so, and I just want to say that we're all sort of faced forward here like in an elevator um, out of necessity the way we sing and we need to read the lyrics to learn them. But I want you to imagine that we're in a circle and we're singing to each other's hearts. This is a really, um, a song that I would have us sing to one another's hearts if we could, and it takes a little getting used to doing that in the real, so let's do it just in our hearts as we're, as we're learning this song. <clears throat> as you go, may you know the love of Christ, how deep and long, how high and wide. As you leave, may to win the prize and find his death to be
Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and make your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who will also do it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us go in the love of our Father God and go in the grace of Christ. Have a safe week.